I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 1. If you use the Blue Bible in your seats, it's page 770. I'm going to read Acts 1, verse 6 down to verse 9. And if you've been here the last few weeks, you'll know we've been looking into these early verses of Acts chapter 1. We're taking a little longer than I originally intended, but I don't apologize for that. These verses, this section is rich, and before uh, we get to Christmas, we will have covered Acts 1 and Acts 2, and laid the foundation, or understood, perhaps, the foundation of the church to which you and I belong today because the church was born in Acts chapter 2 and its purpose its mandate remains intact from the very first moment of its birth until the Lord Jesus Christ returns in Acts 1 and verse 6 it says when they met together this is the disciples and Jesus they asked him Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And therefore, those words in verse 8 are the final, last words of Jesus on earth as a man before he ascended to his Father. Now let's jump a few millennium to Revelation chapter 7. And I want to read verse 9 and 10, where John on the Isle of Patmos has this revelation into events that will take place in the future and in this chapter he is in heaven Revelation 7 it's the last book of the Bible verse 9 after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe people and language notice that every nation every tribe every people every language standing before the throne and in front of the lamb they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb and there we have that marvelous picture of men and women boys and girls from every nation every tribe every people every language but they're singing now in unison salvation belongs to God and you can write across across Revelation chapter 7 after Acts 1 verse 8 mission accomplished every people every nation every tribe every tongue every language but the final commission of Jesus is that that is the task of the church to take that gospel to every tribe and tongue and people and nation you see a church that does not evangelize is a contradiction in terms it's like describing a fire that does not burn a fire that does not burn is a contradiction in terms You see, if we're not evangelizing, we're not actually a biblical church. We might call ourselves that, but we are in actual fact a religious club where we meet for comfort and convenience. But we're not doing the job for which we exist, which includes the evangelization of the world. Now we began to look at this verse 8 last time. Jesus talked about three things I suggested. He talked about power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. We talked about that. And we're going to look in Acts chapter 2 at the reception of that power in a couple of weeks' time. He talked about a purpose. And you will be my witnesses. Not just do witnessing, but be witnesses. It's going to be what you are. And then he talked about a procedure. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we run out of time to talk about that procedure. And so we're going to pick it up this morning. And I'm going to give as a title to this this morning, the global strategy of the church. The global strategy of the church. You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem. In fact, there are a series of ever-expanding circles here. There's first of all Jerusalem, the city. Then Judea, the second circle, the province. Then Samaria, the third circle. That is a new nation or a group of people who share a common culture together, but they were separate from the Jewish people. Now he says you go in, you cross the barrier into that culture, to Samaria. And then the fourth circle is down to the ends of the earth, the globe. And I want to say to you that every healthy church from Acts chapter 2 until today must be involved in those four circles of witness. You see, no church can say, in effect, well, we are a Jerusalem church, we work in our own community, we minister to our community, but we're not involved or concerned about world mission. No biblical church can say that. And no biblical church can say, well, we are called to be a world mission church and we'll leave the local evangelism to somebody else. Because both belong to the responsibility of the church, wherever it lies. One of the statements of Oswald Smith that has often been quoted, he had an apt way of uh, uh, producing uh, sort of slogans, really, quotable statements. He said, the church, the, sorry, he said, he said, the light that shines the furthest shines the brightest at home. That the Jerusalem ministry gives substance and power to the global ministry that will come with the church. Now, some have seen Acts 1.8 as a sort of index to the book of Acts. You'll receive power. That's happened in Acts chapter 2, or 1 and 2, we might say. And you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, that was in Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7. And Judea and Samaria, that's in Acts chapter 8 to Acts chapter 12. And to the ends of the earth, as Acts chapter 13 to chapter 28, when we have Paul's missionary journeys throughout the Mediterranean. Now whether Luke intended it as some sort of index, I don't know, but the fact that the book follows that pattern tells us one thing very simply. They actually were obedient. They did what Jesus told them to do. And the circle spread right to the heart of Rome. In fact, it's not without significance that, that Acts begins in Jerusalem, which in those days was just an outpost of the Roman Empire, but the final chapter takes place in the city of Rome, the very heart and hub of the greatest empire in the world of the day. And you can be sure from Rome, the streams would spread throughout the known world. Now, of course, there's a particular geographical reference here because of where they were. If Jesus had been born in Barry instead of Bethlehem and Jesus made his way to Toronto instead of Jerusalem, he would have probably said, you'll be witnesses in Toronto and in all Ontario and in Quebec. That's a sort of separate culture within the one country as Samaria was and then to the ends of the earth. And every church has to adapt this to their own context and their own setting. Now, as I said just now, it's not just doing witnessing, it's being witnesses, and that is not just speaking, it is a combination of our words and our works. Those two must always go together. What we say and how we live. And again and again, it is the works, as in the case of Jesus, it was his works which provoked the questions, which led to his words of explanation about the gospel, like the night of Nicodemus. A Pharisee, a leader in Jerusalem, came by night, presumably to avoid being seen, knocked on his door. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God. And this is the reason no one can do the things you do unless God is with him. Because there are things about your behavior, your conduct, your works that defy a natural explanation. We know that, that you've come from God. So will you tell me about it? And Jesus said, in effect, Nicodemus, you're right, but you too must be born again. You too can receive the life, spiritual life that you've seen evidenced in me. 
But it was the works that provoked the question from Nicodemus. And I can give you other examples if we had time, which I won't. Now, of course, it's a combination of works and words that go together. I mean, just words or just works are inadequate. You know, an extrovert might say, well, I witness with my words. They just keep talking. An introvert might say, I witness with my works. I just do things. I don't talk about it. Well, of course, we are to live and function and witness in a way that is true to our own personalities. That, that is very true. We're not all to be like each other. But you see, words without works to confirm them would be inadequate. Works, words without, sorry, works, I'm getting confused here, aren't I? <laughs> Let me put it this way. Our works need an explanation. That's why we need words. Our words need authentication. That's why we need works to authenticate the words. Does that make sense? There was a young salesman who was disappointed about losing a big sale. And as he talked with his sales manager, he said to him, well, I suppose it, it just proves that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And the sales manager said, son, take my advice. Your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. Well, that is true in evangelism too. Listen, you and I will never save anybody. I've preached for years now. I've never saved a soul and never can and never will. That is a miraculous work of God. But what we ought to do is to create that thirst. We can't even do that actually, but we create the environment for which that thirst for God is created. Maybe there's some of us here this morning and you're here this morning because somebody maybe at work, maybe somebody in your family, maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend has created a thirst within you. That's why you're here this morning. Some of you watching on television. There's a thirst in your heart and your soul. You know there's a seeking for something bigger than what you have, some meaning you've never found. And it's Christ you're seeking for, that thirst is a work of God in your heart and he'll bring it to fruition as you seek him because if you seek him you'll find him Francis of Assisi famously said to his men when he sent them out use each and every opportunity to preach Christ if necessary use words Does your life, does my life point to Christ? Well, let's follow this ever-expanding circle, beginning with Jerusalem. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That, of course, is where they were at the time. It would have been a lot easier, no doubt, if they'd heard him say, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Peter, would you go up to Antioch? John, would you go to Rome? Uh, Matthew, would you go to North Africa? You see, those would be places where nobody knew them. It might seem as though it might be much easier. But now he says, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, which is not actually their home, because these disciples were in the main Galilean, which is up in the north. They'd only been in Jerusalem since a week before the crucifixion of Jesus, on what we call Palm Sunday, you remember, and he was crucified on the following Friday. This is 40 days after his resurrection, this day of his ascension. So it's less than seven weeks since they were in Jerusalem. But during those seven weeks, they'd exposed themselves as complete failures and full of weakness. You remember that Peter had denied him three times. The rest had all run away and hid when the pressure was on. One of their number had committed suicide. And if we're honest, and I love the honesty of Scripture, these were a messed up group of failures from every human measurable point. 
You can be sure the gossip around Jerusalem, as people talked about the crucifixion of this one who claimed to be the Messiah, they probably said, do you know what happened to those men who were with him? Man, they couldn't see him for dust. They just locked themselves away for fear. And Jesus said, be a witness here. And I imagine Peter might say, excuse me, Jesus, they won't believe me here because they know what I'm like. You see, they, they, they've seen me at my worst moment. Peter, that's the very place I want you to be a witness. I had an email 10 days ago from a guy who said that uh, my pastor tells me that God cannot use people who are in sin. And he described something in his life that he was struggling and fighting with and he had no victory over. I understand fully what his pastor was intending. This young man needs to allow God to work in that area of his life. That is true. But actually, you know, sometimes God uses people in the midst of their failure. I love Hebrews 11, a catalog of men and women who live by faith. We sometimes call it the heroes of the faith. Actually, it's a rogues gallery, if you read it through properly. I mean, look at Samson. What was redeemable about Samson during his period in the book of Judges? Except that despite all his failure, he trusted God in his failure. That's not to encourage you to just continue in things that are wrong, of course. But to say, if you say, well, if I did this and I did that, then I could be used by God. You see, when I was a young Christian, I looked at other people whom God was using, and I wanted to be used by God, but I honestly concluded I wasn't the kind that could be used by God. But I came to realize all God needs is not my ability nor does he need my perfection in any sense. He needs my availability, that my righteousness is to be Christ. He has made unto us righteousness, not our own righteousness, our own righteousness. Anyway, even if we did keep all the rules, it's like filthy rags. If we did everything well, that is not a get ground on which God would use us. And he's saying to these men, go back, despite your brokenness and your disappointment, in fact, during the three years of the time that Jesus had his twelve with him, we could say, quite honestly, he presided over their brokenness for those three years. Came to its climax, really, at the cross when they ran away. Brokenness is God's tool for our good. He says to these men, you be witnesses. You receive power. You be witnesses right here in Jerusalem. And this is purely my imagination, but I can imagine him saying, Peter, remember that girl who asked you if you were one of my disciples and you cursed and denied it? Would you recognize her? Peter, would you go into the city and find her? And tell her you are one of my disciples and tell her what that means? John, you were the last to leave the cross. You were there when that centurion looked up and said, Surely this was the Son of God. John, would you go down to the barracks and look for him? Tell him he's right. James, you saw the Sanhedrin Council act as a mob to get rid of me. Would you go to the Sanhedrin Council and tell them who I am and that I'm alive again? Would you do that for me, James? Matthew. Do you remember they released Barabbas? They offered Barabbas or me, and they released Barabbas and crucified me. Matthew, you came from the underworld. Would you go? You probably know the kind of place where he would hang out. Would you go and look for him? And tell Barabbas I died twice for him. He knows about the once. Tell him about the second time. I died twice for him. On Thomas, you saw the people who mocked at me and spat at me. You go around some of them up and just tell them what was really happening that day. 
Andrew, those Roman soldiers who played a dice with my, uh, for my clothing, would, would you go and find them? You, you'll recognize them because I'll be wearing my clothes. And tell them I love them. Tell them, when they heard me say from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Tell them I was talking about them and I meant it. You see, this was their Jerusalem. The place where they would more naturally hide their heads in shame. And he says, go back into your Jerusalem. It would be much easier if he said, you'll be witnesses. Let's start with a clean sheet of paper. Let's go, let's say Antioch. You'll be witnesses in Antioch and then you can come to Samaria and then the rest of the world. No, no, no. He says, go back to Jerusalem. Listen, let me ask you, where's your Jerusalem? And I don't mean where do you live, but where, where do people know you best for your weakness? It's probably in your home. Do you know, maybe some of us as parents have to go and talk to our kids and apologize to them because the way we've lived at home has turned them away from Christ. But you see, you receive power, said Jesus. This is not in human effort. This is not technique. This is allowing the Spirit of God. Maybe in your place of work, you, you say, well, they know me there. They've seen me lose my cool there. That's the very place. You go back in humility and say, yes, I, I did. But you're a witness to Christ. And then he said, in Jerusalem, then in Judea. Judea was the province of which Jerusalem was the capital, and it was one section of the nation of Israel. And the implication is this. You go out into Judea and make deliberate excursions for the purpose of witnessing to me. Now Judea was not large. I tried to work it out on my map. It's not, of course, square, but it's about 50 kilometers from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, east to west. It's about 40 kilometers from north to south. It probably is no bigger than the area of the GTA. So it's not a big area geographically. Of course, they didn't have the kind of transport we take for granted, so it seemed big to them. It wasn't heavily populated. There was the city of Jerusalem, and then there were smaller towns, you know, Bethlehem and Hebron and uh, places like that. Bethany. But he said, you need to now, in your Jerusalem, begin to say, how are we going to reach out into our community, our province? We'll come back to that in just a moment. And then he said, and to Samaria. Now Samaria was hostile territory. Although it was a section within the greater Israel, as the woman of Samaria said to Jesus when he met her in John chapter 4, she said, why are you talking to me? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And there was a reason why Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. In 722 B.C., the Assyrian superpower of that day had invaded that part of Israel, taken the people off into exile, left a few of them behind to till the ground, sent some Assyrians to oversee them. They intermarried, or at least they interbred with them. And the children they produced were neither Jewish nor Assyrian, and they became known as Samaritans, which is the name of the city, Samaria, that dominated, that was the capital city of that area. And so the Samaritans for 700 years have known rejection and hostility, both from the Jews, in particular from the Jews, because they were not pure, but also from the Gentile community. I mean, that's why the story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan was so shocking in its impact on those first hearers about a man who got beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. And a priest came by and in effect said, I'm in a hurry, I've got a meeting to go to. And a Levite came by. I'm sorry, I don't do this kind of thing. I'm in a hurry too. And so who's going to help this poor man lying on the side of the road? And of all people, the people the Jews would have no dealings with, the Samaritan got off his donkey, bound up his wounds, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, paid for his keep, and cared for him. The significance of that is not just somebody did it, but there was a Samaritan who did it. That's the significance of that story. Totally rejected. Now says Jesus, go to Samaria. What that means is this. When, you've reached, when you're reaching into your city and your area, your province, then he says, cross cultural boundaries that have been set up. Cross the racial boundaries that exist. 
cross the political boundaries that exist, cross the social boundaries that exist, cross the sectarian boundaries that exist. And this could be hard because it'll only face suspicion, of course, and some hostility. Though, you'll find in Acts chapter 8, the first revival outside of Jerusalem took place in Samaria because where people are most hostile, it's often a cover-up for their greatest need and their awareness of that need. But we look at that in chapter 8 a little bit. You know, there's no city in the world probably has as many Samarias as this wonderful city of Toronto. The GTA, not the city, but the GTA is a population of 5 million. That's the greater Toronto area. About 5 million people. It's one of the most multicultural cities in the world, officially. There are over 100 languages and dialects spoken within this city. Over one-third of Toronto residents speak a language other than English at home. One-third. Now, Toronto is not the melting pot that uh, maybe uh, American cities, the south of us tend to be, where everybody merges together. It, it's become more a patchwork quilt where you've got your different identities and different communities. You can go to the parts of the city and there's particular communities that live in those areas of the city. 43% of the population report themselves as being part of a visible minority in this city. 49% of all Toronto residents were born outside of Canada. And Toronto has 79 ethnic publications in this city alone. 79 publications that are ethnically distinct, that you can pick up in bookstores and magazine shops. Now, we thank God that also Toronto is ranked as the safest large metropolitan, metropolitan area in North America. You may not always believe that when you read the newspapers, but it's the safest city in North America. But you know, many of these folks are outside the range of normal Christian influence. And we have to ask the question, we're obligated to ask the question, we as a church, we as a community of churches within this city have to be asking the question, how are we to reach across some of these barriers. And we're doing so. And we have represented here this morning some outreaches that are specifically addressing certain ethnic groups of people within our city. I mentioned uh, Quebec being equivalent to Samaria a moment ago in the fact that Quebec is uh, a country, or not a country, it's a other province, let me not be political here. It's, it's a province within a country that has, a, ha, has an identity of its own, has a culture of its own, has a language of its own. It just so happens to be that Quebec is the least evangelized place in all the Americas. That's North and South and Central America. The least evangelized area is Quebec. And I wonder if we... The church in Canada have taken that seriously enough. And by the way, I'm happy to tell you, in case you don't know, that as from last Sunday morning, we are broadcasting our Sunday morning service translated into French into Quebec every week, starting last week. That's, that's on radio. So that the... 30-minute program that takes basically the message of Sunday, translates into French. I don't preach it, <laughs> but somebody else does. Beginning last week. Because we're concerned, we're asking the question, what is our responsibility in Quebec? You see, said Jesus, Jerusalem belongs to you, so does Judea, so does the responsibility of Samaria. Now, it's very interesting to compare this verse, Acts 1.8, with another verse, Acts 8.1. You ever compare those two verses? You know what Acts 1.8 says. We just read it. You receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Now in Acts chapter 2, they did receive power and their witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 3, they were witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 4, they were witnesses in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 5, they were witnesses in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 6, they were witnesses in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 7, they were witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, it sounds like the needle has got stuck, doesn't it? For those who remember the days of the gramophone. They were told, witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But they're witnesses in Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. This is not just weeks. It is months. It might even have been years. It's hard to exact, be exact about the time span involved there. But they're still in Jerusalem. I, I think it may have got very comfortable in Jerusalem. Every Sunday morning, Peter would preach. Sunday night, John would preach. James the Younger would lead the youth ministry. Mary Magdalene, principal of the Sunday school. Mary, the mother of Jesus, leads the prayer meeting on Tuesdays. Nicodemus leads the Bible study on Wednesday night. Philip is in charge of the outreach program of the church. Stephen was probably the music man because he got martyred. <laughs> That's the high risk role. <laughs> I mean, why would you go to Judea and Samaria when you can be basking every Sunday in the quality of leadership that's going to be there in the church in Jerusalem? First generation men and apostles. Maybe it'll become comfortable in Jerusalem. Do you know, maybe it's comfortable here. It may be that our Christian experience is little more, although we would not really say this to ourselves, but little more than checking in on Sunday morning and checking out at lunchtime. And it's comfortable. And so what happened? Well, let me read Acts 8, verse 1. Stephen, you remember, was martyred. Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, this is the significant bit, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And you never guess what? And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Isn't that interesting? Persecution came against the church. And what happened? What was commissioned in Acts 1.8 is fulfilled in Acts 8.1, not because they said, let's be obedient, but because they were persecuted. And the persecution drives the church to obedience. Now listen, be careful of romanticizing the book of Acts. Be careful of reading the book of Acts with rose-tinted glasses. Be very careful of saying, oh, I wish we were living back in the days of the book of the Acts. Do you know there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts? In 22 of those chapters, the church is being persecuted. Mainly from outside, sometimes from inside as well. And you know, every time, as far as I can see, and I was just thinking about this this week and I ran through it quickly, as far as I can see, every time the church was opposed, it actually grew. Do you know God's tool is not our comfort, God's tool is our discomfort again and again to get the job done. That's why I don't become excited when Christianity becomes popular and the church becomes respected in the community. Because when that happens, often that leads to a complacency and to a superficiality. One of the biggest problems in Europe in my personal perspective, is it the state church phenomena, a legacy of Constantine in the third century, fifth century, third century? One of them. <laughs> third century. Three hundreds, that means it's the fourth century. <laughs> <laughs> is that the church and the state became intertwined? And so you go to any European city and the skyline is dominated by the great churches and cathedrals. But there's a spiritual deadness. Because it's become the status quo. Jesus said in Luke 6, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For that is how your fathers treated the false prophets. And so persecution was used to drive the church into obedience 
But I want you to notice something important here too. It says, this in Acts 8 verse 1, it says, All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Notice that. All except the apostles. So who took the gospel to Judea and Samaria? Everyone except the apostles. Everyone except the professionals, if you like. Now let me be upfront about this. I do not like the distinction that we make between clergy and laity. It is true there are people who are called to certain particular ministries and certain particular responsibilities. It is true the apostles had certain responsibilities. In Acts 2.42, for instance, it says they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. That was their unique responsibility. They had been with Jesus. He'd promised, I'll bring to remembrance everything that I've taught you, or the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance everything i taught you. So their teaching was authoritative. It says in Acts 2, 43, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. That was an apostolic function. By the way, don't get the idea that every Tom, Dick, Harry, and Mary perform miracles in the book of Acts. Miracles in the book of Acts were performed by the apostles. It was an apostolic function. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians, when his apostleship was being undermined, says to them, the things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles were done among you with great perseverance. He says, look, the evidence of my apostleship includes signs, wonders, miracles. But the point I'm making is this. Yes, the apostles had a particular ministry. They were called to a particular ministry. But the evangelization of the world was, I'm going to use a term I don't like, it was a lay movement. I don't like the term, but I've used it anyway now. For want of a better description. And this distinction we sometimes create is artificial. That's why, and this is a purely personal thing, purely personal to me, but I never use the title reverend. I never, you never find out anything that I have any say over as far as writing. It's not my passport. It's not on anything that I print. Because it creates an artificial distinction. In any case, my wife knows I'm not reverend. <laughs> so it would be a lie if you call me reverend. <laughs> but the point is this. It's those except the apostles. You see, it was Philip who took the gospel to Samaria. Philip, not the apostle Philip, but Philip who comes on the scene later, who was one of the deacons in Acts 7. We'll talk about that another time, of course. It was Ananias in Damascus, a believer in Damascus, who led Saul of Tarsus to Christ. The point is this, that the evangelism was the task of the church. I want to define it this way. That evangelism is the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. I'll say that again. I'm going to ask you to say it with me. I'll say it first again. Evangelism is the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. Would you say that with me? Evangelism is the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. Let's do it again. Evangelism is the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. So who does that include? The whole church. If you're not a Christian, you're exempt. But if you are, you're not. And they were to take it to the world by first being involved in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then finally it says to the ends of the earth. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that the more obedient you are the further you will travel this is the corporate responsibility of the church every biblical church is to be a missionary church if it's not a missionary church it's not a biblical church this is part of our responsibility and the local aspect and the global aspect have again sometimes been artificially divided but they're not. They're part of the one event, the one outreach, the one connecting with the world. How we in this church thank God for the vision of Oswald J. Smith when he founded this church that it would be a church that touches the world. 
And it has been that. And we thank God that that has written the DNA of the whole church here. That we're a world missions church, but that world mission is the top of the pyramid that stands on the foundation of the Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem evangelism, the Samaria evangelism, the, 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 the Judea evangelism, the Samaria evangelism, and then the global evangelism. And the local and global are connected. And you know, the modern missionary movement began with William Carey in 1793 when he went to India and for centuries had not been missionaries who had gone from one country across international borders like that. And you know, William Carey faced enormous opposition, much of it from fellow Christians, from the church. In fact, Oswald Smith in his book, The Challenge of Life, says this, that the directors of the East India Company opposed William Carey's work. And they sent this resolution to the British Parliament. I quote it. The sending out of missionaries into one eastern possession is the maddest, most extravagant, most costly, most indefensible project which has ever been suggested by a moonstruck fanatic. That's a good encouragement for missionaries, isn't it? And also Smith adds in that book that in 1796, which is three years after Carey had gone to India, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland passed the following infamous resolution. I quote, To spread the knowledge of the gospel amongst barbarians and heathens seems to us to be highly preposterous. Well, thank God the Church of Scotland changed his mind. And one speaker in the British House of Commons said he'd rather see a band of devils let loose in India than a band of missionaries. But William Carey stood the ground, became the father of modern missions, and you know today in this building we have people from that subcontinent who know Christ in some part because of the movement of William Carey. Now the gospel was in India before William Carey, actually. Pretty reliable tradition tells us the Apostle Thomas went to India, the Martoma Church in South India. Dates his history back to Thomas coming as an apostle in that first century. But nevertheless, the evangelization of the world takes place against overwhelming barriers and obstacles and difficulties and stumbling blocks. But it's the commission of the church. And what Jesus said to those disciples as he gave them the baton and ascended to his father, they passed the baton on and the next generation passed it on and the next generation passed it on and today the baton is in our hands. We have opportunity that the Apostle Paul never dreamt about. We have means of travel. We have means of spreading the gospel. We talked just now about the radio airwaves. We've got the television airwaves. You know, we've got mass communication, mass printing. We've got things that Paul never even dreamt could exist. We have microphones. You can speak to hundreds of people at the same time. It has never been more straightforward. But the baton is in your hand. Both for Jerusalem. What are you doing? As a witness of Christ. Right here. Judea. How are you involved in cro crossing to people who you wouldn't in the normal course of life meet and bump into? How are you doing about crossing over ethnic and cultural barriers to the Samarias of this world? What is our involvement in the global evangelization by the church? It goes back to the beginning of Jesus' statement, you will receive power. Don't see this as simply 
something you do, learn a few techniques, get a bit of training, and you can do it. No, no, he says, wait in Jerusalem, don't do anything, don't do anything until you receive power from on high. We'll see that next week. You wait here. You'll be as bankrupt in your own strength now as you were in your own strength when you fled from the cross. So wait, you'll receive power. And as you live in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, he will so work in you that you will be witnesses. You may be not conscious of it, but you'll be witnesses and you will deliberately adopt the global strategy for the church in your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Do you know anything about this power? I mean, do you? Is, is it a theory or is it reality? Do you know anything about being a witness or, or is that a theory? Do you know anything about global involvement and local involvement? Or is that something everybody else is supposed to be doing? You know, this is exciting. God's power is only available for God's purposes. And the power is bankrupt until we're hooked into the purpose and following the procedure. If you don't know Christ this morning, get to know him quickly. And join this exciting movement and be part of what God is doing. Get to know him here this morning by acknowledging your need. Recognizing I am a sinner. I am separated from God. But Christ died that I might be forgiven. He was raised from the dead that he might then impart his risen life to me through the Holy Spirit. And you say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Please come. Forgive me. And enable me to become born again of the Spirit as you come to live in me. And you'll be part of the team. That's still on the job. Still commissioned. To take the gospel to the world. And you will be around the throne that day. John has already seen it. We know it's coming. When every nation, every tribe, every people, every language will sing in unison the same language. Salvation belongs to God and we're part of it let's pray Lord we're so grateful this morning that the Lord Jesus is on the throne all authority has been entrusted to him and from his throne father we thank you for the incredible commission he's given to us and we want Lord Jesus to be a church it really understands how to reach Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. There won't be a few. It'll be the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. Lead us, guide us, and bless us in this, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.